in the book in isolation. Uh, it is a book <clears throat> that is dealing with a small group of people who God chose uh, to pay, play a big part in the world stage. And when we first hear about him way back in, uh, in time of Egypt and slightly before, because obviously the Bible starts before that, but we, we're not really introduced to God's people until Abraham comes along, uh, <clears throat> and uh, a little bit earlier in this year. But some of the big empires around about are Egypt, uh, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and the Roman Empire. And, and so much of where the Bible touches outside of Israel, it uh, just lets us catch a glimpse into these mighty empires around about. <coughs> and uh, some of the things we learn about them are pretty horrific, uh, and some of those things uh, are, we stand amazed because of the technology that they had back there. Uh, much of the stuff that we take for granted today, for example, uh, the sexagesimal system, and I'll say that in English, <laughs> that means everything that counts in 60s, like 60 seconds, uh, 60 minutes, uh, 60, sexagesimal sex system, uh, they say that they originated in Persia. Uh, they were the first ones to put into uh, uh, this uh, time of, uh, counting method that we use in that in, in time today. Uh, <coughs> they also, Persians were also an, uh, an mighty empire, a huge empire, and they're also uh, given the, uh, the praise for being the first proper uh, interstate postal service. Uh, we hear of, of uh, the Wild West and how they, they used Pony Express in the Wild West. Well, the Persians were doing it way, way, way before the Wild West were invented. Uh, and so uh, Persia, Persia had a, a tremendous um, a system that took the mail from one side of the vast empire uh, to the other side. So they're credited with that. Assyria, uh, some of the pictures of Assyria, uh, really powerful in the day. They had a huge time scale. Assyria were great and weak and great over about an 800 uh, year span altogether. <coughs> and so we see them in glimpses in the Bible in the Old Testament. One of the famous the things they're famous for was uh, they didn't like enemies. And when they took you uh, captive, one of the things they loved to do was to uh, give maybe a four horses uh, and uh, if you watch the fields at this time of year, um, uh, it's been ploughed last year, and after the field is ploughed, they use harrows. And these are big metal spikes. And the truck there pulls the metal spikes over the top of all the ploughed land, uh, that the, the frost had a chance to get at it, and break up the, the, the clumps of, of earth. And then this harrows uh, rips it all apart, and then you can sow on top of it. Okay, so then you come in with your little drills and your sword. Well, the Assyrians had a, a similar idea to that, <laughs> only the problem was they used human captives. Mm -hmm. So they had their uh, two horses or their four horses who would drag this huge beam uh, which filled with big spikes <coughs> and they would see how many captives they could rip apart at any one time. Yeah. And then the other thing they used to love to do was a bit, bit uh, uh, macabre, macabre, if that's the word. Um, they used to decorate their temples and they'd have big pillars like you see in, in, in Greece uh, and what they do is they'd use human skin uh, to decorate the temple pillars and uh, 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 columns uh, and the other thing they liked, they liked a little bit of light at night so they used a human skull and they put their oil in the base of the human skull and have the, the, so you imagine that kind of uh, shape of the flicker of the light coming out of this time of night so they were quite a nice people to get to know uh, as long as they were on your side but if you weren't on your side, you were in bad trouble. All right? uh, the Babylon, Babylonians had a totally different idea of, of captivity. They quite often tried to re-educate people. And when Jerusalem fell in, in 537 and 38, uh, <coughs> uh, that had been the third time that Babylon came to take, uh, take the Israelite people captive. The first time they came to take them captive, they took the elite, they took the kings and the princes and, and all the top people and to carry them off to the Babylon captivity. <clears throat> put in their own kind of uh, man in control, uh, who was like a, a puppet king, uh, and uh, they, as long as you paid your taxes, they would leave you alone. You could continue your customs, you could continue your way of life, do what you like, as long as you paid your taxes, they wouldn't bother you. But of course, uh, a new king comes along and says, well, we've been paying taxes a bit too long, so let's stop doing that, because Egypt was making big noises about, oh, we can take on the Babylonians. So Israel, Israel decided to go along with Egypt, and of course, Babylon heard there was going to be an uprising, so they kept hammering back down, 
and uh, 538, 539, uh, they um, uh, took the second wave. So where are the top, they've taken the first top tier, the elite, away the first time. The second time they come back and took the next level. Uh, the, high, the high priest and all the, the top entry on the latter uh, amount of people. Uh, and again, put a puppet king in, in control. They didn't want to wipe the people out. They just wanted to re-educate them. So they took the elite away, and some of the elite in their own place got, got very well looked after. And um, then, of course, uh, people don't like paying taxes, as you do. So what they did, they rebelled again. So Babylon thought, right, that's I've had enough. And so he swept back down. Five, six, five, uh, three, uh, five, eight, six, and seven. That's uh, And he came through them back down, and this time they, they literally wiped the place flat. They flattened the temple, flattened Jerusalem, and carried away the, much of the rest of the population off into captivity. Now, under Assyria, uh, there were twelve tribes. Sorry, still in Israel, ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south. The twelve tribes in the north, when Assyria attacked, they uh, literally took the whole. Ten tribes into captivity, and what they did, uh, the ones that didn't kill, they allowed to intermarry, and so by the time this time comes along, about 612 and stuff like that, um, the Assyrians have uh, really decimated the true line of the Israelites in the twelve tribes, and you catch a small glimpse of them later on when Jesus talking to the woman by the well, a, a, a Samaritan woman, and the Samaritans were a race that was left over, if you like, from this assimilation between the Assyrians and the Israelites of the ten tribes. So that's why they, they still thought of the one true God, but they had a little bit uh, a difference of opinion over where they should worship God, how they should worship God, and stuff like that, which was a problem that the, 12 tribes, uh, the ten tribes had already, because they, instead of worshiping Jerusalem, they set up their own uh, tribal uh, uh, temple and stuff up north because they didn't want to uh, uh, be seen to kowtow or bow down to uh, the two tribes, Judah especially, in the, in the south. So Assyria uh, basically wiped out uh, and, and assimilated the ten tribes of Israel in the north, but the Babylonian uh, captivity uh, kept, the, kept the nation fairly pure. As a matter of fact, that was the purpose. God said through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, and ultimately Daniel, who actually writes from captivity in Babylon, he says to them, look, uh, because of your sin, because of your rebelliousness, <coughs> you, you need to sort yourselves out. And the only way I can purify you, sort you out, through the prophets, <coughs> is to carry on, get, allow you to be carried off in captivity. Perhaps if you lose everything you've got, you'll come to your senses and, and, and be prepared to get your act back together and be my people again. And, and so they were carried off into uh, Babylonian captivity. And then 70 years later, they came back out of that captivity and they rebuilt the temple, rebuilt Jerusalem, and <clears throat> that's the Jerusalem, technically the Jerusalem that you saw in Jesus' time. Uh, it was a different temple, uh, because that temple also was destroyed. Later on, the, the, the temple that was around when Jesus was around was actually built by Herod. Now Herod, he was a funny guy, because he wasn't, he wasn't a pure breed either. He was an Edomite, originally, uh, background-wise, uh, and the Edomites used to be um, related to the Israelites way back in Abraham's time. Because you remember Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, and Ishmael became the leader or the beginning of the of the Arab nations came from him. Uh, and through uh, later Judah, Isaac and Judah, uh, you've got the, the, the Jewish nation. So technically, if you go back in time, the Arabs and the Jews were brothers. But in a certain point of their uh, heyday, the Edomites used to uh, look down upon the Israelites uh, and watch them get beat up by everybody else. And then when, when they were weak enough, the Edomites used to then come down from, because they used to be uh, where the city of Petra is, the, on the, the big heights. They used to sweep down, they used to beat up the rest and carry off all the, all the goods that were left over. Uh, so they weren't, they weren't good stuff. But that was um, a Herod, his background was that tribe. So he, he kind of laid some, some claim to try and be pro-Jewish in his day. And so he had to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, which he ruled over. So, uh, in Daniel speaking in the time of Babylon, uh, it talks about after uh, Babylon being finished, 
He says, Babylon, you are the head of gold. You're, you're around now. He says, okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay. He says, you're around now. But, he says, after you is going to come into the uh, three mighty empires. And he talked about the Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire. We actually don't call it the Persian Empire. We call it the Medo-Persian Empire. Because there was the Medes and, and, and the Persians who got together at that particular time. And they were very, very powerful. Uh, but he talked about the Grecian Empire and he talked about the Roman Empire. And he says in the days of the Roman Empire, God is going to set up a kingdom. And that's talking about Jesus Christ, the King. And Jesus is the fulfillment of much of what Daniel said back in, in, uh, in his Babylonian captivity. <coughs> he says in the days of these kings, God's going to set up a kingdom that can never be destroyed. And he wasn't talking about a physical kingdom, he was talking about you and me. He was talking about the spiritual kingdom, the church, the family of God, the new Jerusalem, the new Jews, if you like, the new Israel of God. And that's us. And he says, uh, we're going to survive until Christ comes back again and wipes it all and starts, you know, whatever it's doing. Anyway, so uh, what you've got there, history. So where the Bible's talking about primarily the, the history of the Israel, it also touches on all these nations in passing. Okay? So when we understand that, we can understand some of the, the writing, where the people were writing from, the background, the captivities that were going on, and all that. And that helps us to get a bigger picture. And if we can get the bigger picture, then it makes us, helps us to be able to interpret the Bible properly, because we understand where it's coming from. Who's asked, who's, who's speaking, who's he speaking to? Does it apply to us? Does it just apply to them? Uh, and all that type of questions we can ask ourselves, okay? So that's why it's important to know. And then, at the end, of the last book in the Old Testament was a book called Malachi, and there was no other writings that were accepted uh, until uh, the Gospels come along and Christ came along. 400 years where there had been no prophet. They were looking for a prophet. They called that prophet, Elijah will come again before the Christ comes. And Jesus, talking about John the Baptizer, he says, John the Baptizer was Elijah. He came in, the, he wasn't Elijah, he came in the spirit of Elijah, okay? John, the same, he came out of the desert, he came wearing that, that uh, uh, rough looking garments, and he preached a message that made the people get, repent and get back to God, and get back and be good Jews again, because the king's coming. And uh, he used a term of, for uh, John the Baptizer, he says, he prepared the way of the Lord. He flattened the high places and he made a, a path straight for the Lord. Whenever royalty comes to, to Corby even, we, we, we clean up the gutters, we paint the you know, doors. If you, if, you, if you stand still long enough in the wrong place, you get painted because the king's queen's coming. Uh, so that's what, that's what John the Baptizer did. He prepared the way, he prepares people's hearts and minds for the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, to come. And uh, he was say, the one who broke the 400 years of silence. Okay, <clears throat> we'll use that. So, as well as the historical background, the, the nations around about, then we really come to terms with uh, the different books of the Bible and what they stand for and try and get a mental picture in our mind. It's a massive time we've got here. Creation, pre flood, whatever you think of God, God claims uh, to be speaking. In the book, in, in the Bible, and he says, in the beginning was, a, was God, and God created the heavens and the earth. That's found in Genesis chapters 1 through to chapter 5. And then uh, men got out of control, they started doing evil, he says that, that man's uh, intention of heart was evil all the time, and God said, I'm going to wipe them all out. Okay, so he gets ready for the flood, Genesis chapter 6 through to 11, they've got the flood comes and destroys most of the people. Old Noah stand up and say, and say, look, God's going to destroy you a lot if you don't start your acting together. But he's provided a way of escape. I'm building a boat. If you want to get in the boat, you're going to be able to, to get away with, uh, away from the, 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 the consequences of sin, if you like. And uh, so people just laughed at him. And that's interesting because up to this time, in Genesis chapter 11, it actually says there was no rain upon the earth. <clears throat> now, an interesting thing happened to me about three weeks ago. I was called between here in Tetran, and it was one of those mornings where it was very cold in the ground, but the sun was coming up. And when you went past the fields on the right hand side, it was like looking at a forest fire. It was just smoke. It wasn't really smoke, it was mist. 
<coughs> but it must have been stood about three, four feet high off the ground as the heat above met the cold earth beneath. And it was just, if, you, if you'd gone for a walk in it, you'd have got saturated. Mm-hmm. You know? It would, it would, you would have got lost as well. You would have got lost as well, that's true. <laughs> okay, but you get saturated because the moisture would then go back in the earth. Well, at this particular time, that's what happened all over the earth. The, 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 it was more like a semi-tropical or a tropical kind of situation. And, and the, the atmosphere, the, the mist rose, and it naturally, uh, a, 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 a water, that's what it was, water the earth. But after the, the flood happened, uh, the geology changed, and, and then you got this uh, more cloud effect, and you got more rain and, and, uh, uh, coming along. <clears throat> in our lifetime, we've done the same thing. When the um, when the Russians helped the Sudan, Sudanese build the Sudan Dam, the dam was so big that there were places in, in the Sudan where it never rained. It was like a semi desert, and because they had this monstrous piece of water suddenly uh, all in one place, it actually changed the climate, and people were rained on for a very fast time in ages. Uh, Similar thing happened under the 70 years under communism. One of their big ideas was that everybody uh, should have worked together for the common good. You know, that meant work together for the people who talked to write off the money. That's a, a story. But anyway, what, one of the ways they wanted to do that was to have communities. And these communities were given one product to build. So if you were in a, a particular uh, uh, part of the, the, the Russian Federation, you would produce all the corn. If you were in a particular part of the Russian Federation, you would produce all the steel. <clears throat> if you were in a particular part, you would be manufacturing trains. And so whole communities were built around one industry in one place and, and, and all these different parts of Russia. Uh, one group were given a, a particular crop, I think, I can't remember, I told, just escaped me there which crop it was. Oh, cotton. They were given the production of cotton so you could uh, make things, you know, grow cotton and you roll it up and you make the gel use it up. Mm. Anyway, well they were given the cotton production. The problem with cotton is, it's really thirsty. The plant that produces cotton is really thirsty. So where they were given uh, the uh, authority to produce these hundreds and thousands of, of pieces of cotton, as it grew, there was an inland sea. And it, cotton was so hungry, that it, it or thirsty, it, it actually drank all the water from all the small rivers that were feeding the sea. And what happened over a very short period of time, because remember communism won't last in 70 years, uh, what happened was the inland sea was drained and it became just a salt sea with no water in it. And even worse, when the wind came along, it then blew the salt out of the sea. And where do you think it blew it? Onto the, oh, the cotton fields. <laughs> wiped the whole, the whole industry out. Yeah. Uh, you know, climate change, we are big enough, if our industries are big enough, to change the local climate. Interesting, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Anyway, then you come on to the patriarchal age, alright? So the patriarchal age, patriarchs, means they governed by the fathers, leadership by the fathers of the tribe. So you've got people in there like uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, people like that were in the patriarchal age. So, up to this point here, there were no Jews. Up to this point here, there were no Israel. Because it hadn't existed. Abraham was the father of Israel. Abraham also was the father, through Ishmael, of all the other nations. It was going to come to him. So Genesis 12 to 50 gives you the story of the multiplication of these tribes into a, uh, from the son of promise, who was Isaac, uh, talking about the, the Jesus was to come. Um, you had the uh, growth of Judah near the end there, and the death of Judah. Uh, and you've got, uh, coming into Exodus, you've got Joseph, the next one that takes off the Egyptian bondage. Okay, so uh, you've got a story there of the patriarchal age. So when you're reading your Bible, and you're looking at uh, this fast book of the Bible, you've got a massive of time period covered, and lots of important things happening in that history. Then you come into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They deal with the um, captivity under Egypt, where they're made to build uh, grain cities, and they've dug up some of these uh, in, in archaeology today. The grain cities, uh, 
And then you've got uh, the giving of the law in, in the tail end of Exodus, about chapter uh, 25, there talks about the building of the temple for the first time. But before that, you had, uh, well, before the into that, there's a tabernacle, sorry, not building the temple, there's a tabernacle that. Uh, and the giving of the law, Leviticus, where the Levitic Levite, the priest, priestly tribe, one of 12 tribes, the priestly tribe, Levite, uh, they were to look after all the religious side. And the other 11 tribes were to kind of keep them as well as keep themselves. And so you've got uh, in numbers and numbering people. Wilderness wanderings, well, uh, they're, they're complaining and, and, and uh, everything about God. Uh, God said, okay, you can wander about there as long as you like, uh, and I'll, I'll, get you, I'll bring you to the promised land at some time. Uh, and in the conquest, you've got Joshua takes you to the promised land. Then you've got a settlement within the promised land, Judges, Judges of Ruth, that's Second Samuel, first up to chapter 8 there. Uh, and there you've got, uh, then the people say, well, we're fed up again, God. We want a king like everybody else. So uh, you have the United Kingdom, first three kings, Saul, uh, David, and Solomon. And then you have the divided kingdom comes along. Divided kingdom, I'm not going to go into that, it's too complicated, but it's, it's good reading. Uh, <clears throat> and then in all that period, you've got these prophets were speaking and saying, God, from God, said, you guys need to get your act together. Because they kept going off and uh, doing their own thing and mess, they end up in all sorts of trouble. And they have to keep coming back to God. Matter of fact, Amos in the middle there, he's a famous little statement. He talks about, have you ever hung wallpaper? If you ever hung wallpaper and you do it properly, you use a plumb line. That's a piece of string hangs down with a weight in the bottom. And you put it up, uh, uh, a pen or something in the top of your wall, and it hangs down, your first piece of paper, you take it over and you, you line it up with a plumb line. If you get the first one right, there's a good chance by the time you get around there, it's still going to be straight. Mm -hmm. But if you get the first one wrong, <laughs> no matter what time you get around there, you're going to be all over the place. He says to the nation of Israel, he says, there's a plumb line. He said, where are you compared with God? He said, well, you're over here somewhere. Well, what are you going to do about it? You need to get back in line. You need to listen to God, get back to what God intended you to do. <clears throat> that was a plumb line. He must be in company. And that's the same for us today. The Bible is our plumb line. It helps us to understand who God is, what God wants of our lives, and how we need to get our lives back together in, in, in the right way. So that's the plumb line. <clears throat> the captivity, carried off into captivity, and these prophets stuck under that, that particular period. And then Judah, uh, 12 tribes disappear off, uh, being uh, carried off into captivity, and then he leaves two tribes, Judah and, and Benjamin. Judah's the, the big tribe, so you hardly ever hear Benjamin mentioned, but it's, it's Judah and Benjamin really. And so that period works there where there, the Judah alone is left. And out of Judah is to come the Christ. He's going to come through that line. Okay, Jesus is going to come through the line. So you get the big picture. Alright? Captivity of Babylon we talked about. Here's Daniel carried off the captivity 606. <coughs> Ezekiel talking in captivity 597. And then Jeremiah and Lamentations ended up in 586, 597. And Babylon comes down and wipes them all out. He said, right, I've had enough. The temple disappears, Jerusalem disappears. Then, uh, 70 years later, which was prophesied by Daniel, no, prophesied by Isaiah actually, a little bit earlier, he says, he actually names the guy who's in charge of everything, who is going to let the people go. A guy called Cyrus. It's actually in the Bible. Again, a lot of people who don't believe the Bible says, oh, how on earth can you name somebody uh, before the fact? That couldn't have been written until, oh, a couple hundred years after Christ. But it was right enough. They dug up lots of stuff and showed that letters were written back when they should have been written. And therefore, uh, God, and he, God helped uh, the writer to understand the man who was to make the decree or make the statement that was going to allow the people to go back uh, to Jerusalem to rebuild Jerusalem. A guy called Cyrus, named in the Bible. And actually, since then, they've dug up, uh, I think it's, you call it a stele. It's a, it's a little cylinder, and it's got all the, the writing on it, and he's mentioned on the writing. You know? People said he didn't exist. It's oh, actually the Bible. Oh, they've actually dug them up. Okay. Uh, so that's interesting. Well, I think it's interesting. Anyway, seven years, four hundred to, uh, through the, uh, to Christ. And you've got the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <clears throat> when you when you try to memorize the books of the Bible, you start off with Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Psalm, all the rest, okay? And then you come to the New Testament, then you've got Matthew, Luke, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the rest follow on. It's simple as that. <laughs> no, okay. 
so I established with the group the history, book of history, Acts is a book of history. And the letters, Romans through to Jude, 21 letters. And then you've got the book of prophecy and revelation. Okay? So here, if you can picture in your mind, here's a kind of a time scale through the book of Judges. Uh, United Kingdom, Northern Kingdom, at 12 tri 10 tribes, Southern Kingdom, 2 tribes, the exile, the return from exile. Some of the prophets that spoke and when they spoke. <clears throat> if you get those, when you're looking at the Old Testament, you say, ah, oh, Haggai, oh yeah, when did he speak? <coughs> you can match him up with where he was, uh, like four, just between four and, and five, if you're looking backwards, five, three, eight, and four, you're going to count down the way. So that's when he spoke. When about uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah? Oh, it's early on, 727. 72, 35, so you can get a picture. So you know when the guys are speaking and some of the background of what they're, what they're dealing with, some of the complications they've got to deal with, some of the nations around about, and, and give you a picture in your mind. So the idea is not just to know the Bible, just for the sake of knowing what the Bible says. There's actually people in India with very, very good memories. And there's a number of people who've done it before. One particular guy that a friend of mine met, and uh, this guy had memorized the whole of the Bible. But it didn't make a scrap of difference in his life. Because he used it as a, just an educational exercise. He didn't use it to know who God was. And come to know who God was. He just used it as an academic exercise. And we can do the same. We can just look after intellectual knowledge and don't recognize that we're talking about a relationship with the God of the universe who loved us so much that his son died for us then we'll lose the point. We, we miss the point, okay? And the ultimate idea is to have a better relationship with God. To help the greater guests to know this God that, that uh, we talk about. So way back from Abraham, some of the great people of, of God, Joshua, Judges, Malachi, Bath of Christ, John the Baptizer, they have Pentecost, Paul's death even, at the end of the book of Acts, and then the letters that continue from that. See how uh, it all spreads through. So if you can catch these images, you know, take a mental photograph. Then when you're looking in your Bible, you can have a picture where some of these events take place. And that's helpful. To get it in the setting, to get its background. Because everything is in its context. There are three important words that you always use in the body. The first one is context. And the second one is context. context. That's interesting. <laughs> and the third one is context. context. Yes. If you can get those three right, then you can begin to understand what the Bible says. You can interpret it for yourself. If you understand the context in which the writer was writing, what problems he was facing, what problems God wanted him to deal with, then that helps us to understand the implications of what it means. And it also understand for us, if there's something in it for us as well. Romans, the book of Romans, near the end there, it says, these things are written that you might have hope. These are things in the old time, the time were written. Why? Because you see God dealing with his people. And how did God deal with his people? He was faithful. Time after time, despite the people, God has seemed to be faithful. So when it comes to us and our relationship with God, then we have confidence that God, the same God, is still faithful. And sometimes when we get it wrong, when we say that wrong thing or do that wrong thing, in the wider context of things, God still loves us. Crazily enough, he still believes in us. He still wants the best for us. And that's an important aspect. God is a God of love at the end of the day. So how do we find our way around the Bible without getting provoked to anger? Somebody says, uh, Jeremiah 22 says such and such. You think, Jeremiah 22, where do I start? Uh, you know, where's Jeremiah 22? All right. So you can sometimes get frustrated with that fine. You get some of the smaller books as well, it's a big problem. But fortunately for us, a couple of hundred years ago, a couple of, a little bit long, older than that, long, longer than that, somebody divided the books into chapters. And then he went even further, he divided the chapters into verses. Now in Jesus' time, when you'll read about Jesus going into the into the synagogue and reading from the book of Isaiah. He's reading from a scroll that's about 30 feet long and he's got to find just the bit that he wants to read out of the middle. No chapters, no verses. That's brilliant. They were actually in the study world, there were specialist people who were in charge of the scrolls. And Jesus had the ability to understand them for himself. 
That's magic. I can't find a way out. Even with chapter the verses, I'll be talking some days. Okay? But we are far better off, okay? Something broken down into chapters and verses. So that helps. So when you see a scripture quoted, a number used, that's something can, you can find it quickly. For example, Genesis 2, and those little two dots in there on the one main, it's the second chapter of Genesis. And it's the first verse in that chapter. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Alright? So there you got there, Genesis, where, where are we by Scott? Genesis 2, verse 1. There's a code. And you've cracked the code. You know what it means. That's excellent. So it's a, 2 stands for the second chapter, and the ones in behind those things stand for the first verse. See no way to find it. Okay? If a quote includes, whoops, get back. If a quote includes more than one verse, you give the verses a hyphen between them. If they're exactly next to each other, and a comma if they aren't exactly next to each other. What does that mean? Okay? Genesis chapter 2, 1, hyphen, dash, verse 5. Means all the verses between 1 and 5. So I just ask you to read. Can you read Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 5? You'd read 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Read a whole lot. If, on the other hand, I said, uh, read verse 2, verse 1, comma 5, you'd read verse 1, and you'd read verse 5. Because that's relevant to what you want to say. Okay? So it's simple, isn't it? Piece of cake. Magic. Most verses are small enough to memorize when you believe. <laughs> okay. Right. So, anyway, story of the Bible, one sentence. God was heartbroken when his perfect creation turned against them. He gave Jesus to come into our world to pay for our rebellion and begin a process of healing which will complete when returns. Okay? That's God wants us to come home with them. So he looked out to steps for us. And that verse is found in the Second Opinions chapter. Oh, sorry, it's not in the Bible, that one. <laughs> That's second opinion. Most things that people say that are not in the Bible, you'll find them in second opinions. Alright? Alright. Hint. There's no such book in the Bible. Don't bother looking for it. But this sentence sums up what the Bible's all about. What makes the Bible different? It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. The breath of God is Holy Spirit is the only one that gives us life. Otherwise, we would just be dead. Because the Bible's inspired, it is alive. It's a living and active, and uh, as the Hebrew writer says, as a two-edged sword. Four quick ideas. God wrote it for us to learn about him. When the fall happened, we lost our ability to hear him. He needed to give us the word to teach us about himself. When Jesus died, the lawsuit Satan had filed against us was ended. Case closed. Jesus has always existed as our God, our Father, should go around. Jesus chose to become human and did this in order to be able to die for us. When Jesus died, sorry about that, right. blah, 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 blah. Oh, apples, good stuff. Uh, the world is only the beginning. If it's there, it's where we are fighting a war to enforce Jesus' legal right to complete ownership and prepare us for being with him throughout time and eternity. As you eat the word, your inner God-created being will grow stronger and your life will start to change. And that's called bearing the fruit of the Spirit in the Bible. Okay? The toughest part of any building project is the foundation. If it is muddy and a lot of work is to be done, you won't see much progress. You need to dig deeper to support a taller building, the footprint of the foundation, the amount of steel you're sinking with, the careful curing of the country all take time. If you take shortcuts for the foundation, it will limit how big your building can be. If the foundation isn't strong, eventually the building will come down. You are building a foundation. God is one of the tools you use to dig a foundation of steel bar you're sinking your life to give you the added strength. <coughs> the concrete that God and you pour into your soul. It's worth the effort once foundation is set, the building goes up faster and faster. It's a lamp to guide us, it is food to sustain us, it's a sword of the spirit, it is a compass pointing God in Christ and our salvation. Right. Okay, simple as that, really. So that's what the Bible is. We'll need to spend the rest of our time, the rest of our life. Uh, trying to understand it and looking at <coughs> our lives and seeing how God can change us, mold us, make us into the kind of people he wants us to be. It's our workshop manual to help us, help God guide us through life and help us to sort out some of the problems and challenges we have. Okay, Ray, Ray would you can we just about that?